Petco News special coverage of Consensus 2024 is brought to you by Diamond Standard. This is Kitco News. I'm Michelle McCory coming to you from Consensus 2024 here in Austin, Texas. And joining me now is a fan favorite on Kitco, Michael Wilkerson, founder of Stormwall Advisors. Michael, of course, has over 30 years experience in the financial sector, being a managing director at Lazard, focusing on emerging markets, amongst many other credentials. Great to have you with us, Michael. Michelle, great to be back. So, a lot of buzz at the conference this year, and it seems to me as though one of the biggest overtones is crypto becoming a big political issue. What have been your impressions on that front? Well, first of all, the first impression I've had here is the energy level. Uh, crypto is back in many ways. Compared to the last year, more of a bear market, there's a lot of excitement, a lot of talk about big picture things, like tokenization of real world assets has become one of the main themes. But you've hit on something very important is there's been a lot of discussion, almost every panel that I've been a part of, around the question of crypto's role in politics. It, it seems that, uh, for example, the crypto industry has suddenly woken up to some of the issues that pertain to them. And it's so fascinating because largely you could say that uh, crypto, crypto uh, people tend to skew younger, uh, maybe less politically involved, maybe would consider themselves independents. But a lot of the things that we've seen in the last couple of years uh, around the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission's, uh, what appears to be really an attack on the crypto industry, I, I think has woken up a lot of people. Now, one of the things that's just happened recently that uh, has been uh, really created quite a, quite a bit of buzz is the SEC, which appeared to be nowhere near right. approving an Ethereum uh, spot ETF, suddenly did a 180 turn, and it looks like this is going to happen. So the first step of the process, clearing the uh, 19B4s, uh, it's not the only step. We need to get to final S1s. But basically, it is, it is a clear indication that the SEC has green-lighted uh, Ethereum ETFs. Right. No one expected this. No, certainly not even Kathy Wood from ARC because she took the stage here saying how surprised that she was by this decision and uh, that the SEC didn't ask the same type of questions to ARC as they did before, the spot Bitcoin ETF, that this totally took her by surprise. I'm quoting her here. The read was it was not going to be approved. It was absolutely not going to be approved. If it were to have been approved the regular way, we would have been getting questions from the SEC. No one was getting questions from the SEC beforehand. And she also mentioned how this seemed to happen as Trump was developing a more favorable crypto policy, being very vocal about that. She kind of alluded to the fact, as others have as well, that perhaps you know the Biden administration may have given Gary Gensler a tap on the shoulder and saying, we're coming across as very anti-crypto. This is a big voter block. Do something about that. Speculation and something that she kind of alluded to. What's your read on that? Well, it's interesting because if you look at what's happened over the last uh, few months, first of all, uh, it's been very clear that the Biden administration and, and some members of the Senate in particular uh, have taken a very anti-crypto stance. It was uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., the candidate, who first started to come out as a candidate and talk about crypto from a positive perspective. He appeared at Ethereum Denver. He's here at, at Consensus. We'll be speaking today. And uh, Trump, who during his presidency said he was not a fan of crypto, uh, has indeed changed tune. So it has become an issue that uh, the politicians are aware of. But it's because there has been this raise, uh, increased awareness by people in, in the industry. Going back to the Ethereum ETF, uh, just a few days ago, some of the best legal minds in crypto were saying 75% odds against. Right. Yeah. And the discount on the uh, Grayscale Ethereum Trust was at about 25% discount to net asset value. That closed to 1% in a day when the SEC made, made these moves. So a lot of people didn't believe it was going to happen. And there is a lot, uh, there is a view, and I, I share this view, that the Biden administration has become very concerned. It's been an uh-oh moment of this is a big block. If they, if they turn against us as a single issue voter, that could really hurt uh, the re-election process. And it's true at the presidential level, the Senate and the House. All right, let's bring it back to what the approval of this ETF means in terms of price forecasts. We haven't seen tremendous movement on ETH. It hasn't breached its all-time high yet. Is that because the ETFs are kind of behind on the process of launching because this kind of took people by surprise? 
So I think there are a few things. One is that there was this expectation that it was not going to happen. So Ethereum really had no price movement, price up, action. Yeah. There's no build up. So uh, similarly to the closing of the NAV, Ethereum's price went up from about, let's call it 3,300 to 3,750 or so where it is today. Still not at an all time high, whereas Bitcoin crossed its previous all time high uh, and now continues to trade pretty close to uh, $70,000. It's at 68.5 as we go to, um, as we, as we do, do our talk today. I believe that Ethereum is still vastly undervalued and underrepresented in terms of its real potential. You're still seeing a, a broader crypto market with heavy Bitcoin dominance, about 55, 56% of the total market. Uh, there's been a lot of developments in Ethereum, including uh, the merge, including uh, a lot of development on uh, Ethereum as a layer one by, by other, uh, other rollups uh, and, and other chains. So I really don't think that what we're seeing in, in the price uh, of Ethereum today reflects all of those developments. Being able to have an Ethereum, excuse me, Ethereum ETF will be a help. One of the things, one of the issues that people believe is out there is that the SEC, one of the things that the companies are having to change is uh, the ability to stake. So uh, the view today is it's unlikely that, in, that uh, any Ethereum ETF will involve staking. It will be purely uh, a, a two-hold asset without the ability to get yield. That may be a temporary factor on Ethereum price. You know, Michael, b before we get more into the price action, that brings up a whole issue whether these ETF products are contrary to the ethos of cryptocurrencies. If you're not able to stake and, and verify using ETH, if Bitcoin is held in an ETF and you're not actually able to use it as a medium of exchange, as a real currency, are the premises that cryptocurrencies were formed on in a way being eroded by the fact that they're sort of being absorbed into this traditional financial system that these institutions are getting involved. I mean, it may be great for the price, but is it very contrary to the founding missions and principles of Bitcoin and of Ethereum? I think absolutely. Uh, Bitcoin was originally formed as a peer-to-peer -peer method of cash transfer, uh, decentralized, trustless, and Bitcoin, one could argue, has failed so far in that mission as a medium of exchange. Uh, today, Bitcoin is largely perceived as a, as a store of value. I think the Ethereum network has been much more effective in at least taking the steps necessary to make it an effective medium of exchange, although neither are serving the purpose well today. Well, why is that? In order for money to be good money, it needs to be a stable store of value and a medium of exchange that both buyer and seller trust and recognize. Stable coins have stepped into that gap and we're seeing dramatic growth in the stable coin market. What's fascinating to me about that is so far, 99% of all the stable coin volume out there is backed by the US dollar. And so what this is implying, in some ways, the anti-crypto army within the, the US government may also be waking up to the fact, uh, and Coinbase's chief legal, legal officer and former Trump comptroller of the currency has talked about this, that uh, stable coins may be quite good for the US dollar by uh, continuing to, to just to back it as a reserve currency in, in a newly developing form of a market that in some ways is analogous to the euro dollar market, which just a few years ago was an $18 trillion market. So that awareness that, ah, perhaps crypto isn't the enemy of the dollar, but could actually be supportive, I think is slowly working its way into the awareness of, uh, of our government administrators and, and politicians. Right, um, and that's a point that we've had Nick Carter make on the show that in a way, stable coins and tokenized US treasuries can actually help the dollar maintain its status as the global reserve currency. Let's go back to ETH though. Um, Ethan, in an ETF, you said a challenge for staking, a challenge to the actual operation of ETH. What does it mean though for the price. When this ETF is officially launched, which I believe they're looking at the earliest dates, June or July, what do you anticipate then? I don't think the formalization of actual trading of the ETF really will affect price very much. We saw that with the Bitcoin ETF. This is very much a, a buy the rumor, sell the news type of event. The price action was priced in this week, this past week. So I, I don't believe we're going to see a big change purely on the fact that we get uh, ETF trading. Well, what about the demand aspect of uh, 
if these ETFs now need to fill up their demand. That's right. So we'll see we'll see some, but again, as we saw with Bitcoin, a lot of that anticipated the actual uh, the actual trading of, of the ETFs. We saw a lot of volume come in. Um, Ethereum is a smaller market. We saw as a as an analogous point, or at least an interesting data data point, is that when Hong Kong Exchange allowed trading of Bitcoin and Ethereum, we didn't see a whole lot of movement. Smaller market, not as much interest. The U.S. will have a, a multiple of that, to be sure. I just think that some of that pricing has already been uh, priced in. Do you see ETH making a new all-time high, though? Uh, it should have already. I'm surprised it didn't. But I believe that uh, in this cycle, in 2024, Ethereum should, uh, without doubt, in my mind at least, uh, be able to get above its all-time high and potentially cross five five thousand dollars by the end of the year. Five thousand dollars by the end of the year. That's way more than its all-time high. Um, what about demand for Bitcoin? For those that aren't that savvy necessarily, they hear ETH ETF, they hear Bitcoin ETF, they go, oh, I just want exposure to crypto. Do you see the spot ETH ETF impacting Bitcoin? I think they're very different markets and very different investor types. Now, your point is a different one, which is for an investor who's not uh, aware about crypto, does it matter? And there I would say probably not. It wouldn't surprise me to see uh, some attempts at some hybrid types of products where it's not available today, but, but, but could someone offer up, here's a crypto exposure to ETF, a, wait, a, a basket weighting of Bitcoin and Ethereum. Again, that's not a today issue, but that might be a way to- I think you just to, came up with a new product. New product. There you go. Um, but in the meantime, I think that Ethereum, part of this is, of course, marketing and making people aware outside of the normal, uh, let's call it the crypto community, just everyday normal people who aren't exposed to it their uh, investment advisors, but also just in, in the public knowledge. And you saw it a bit with the Bitcoin ETFs. We can't walk through an airport these days without one of the big ETF providers advertising well, why they're the best Bitcoin uh, ETF. And I think you'll see the same thing for Ethereum. And in some ways, it could create a, 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 a buzz and a renaissance in the price. Where are we in terms of the ETF demand right now for Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin demand has slowed. I think we've seen all the fill that's going to happen. We had a little bit of net outflows for a couple of days, but I think now we're back to, compared to the first few days, uh, relatively stable at this point as to uh, Bitcoin ETF uh, demand. What does that mean then for Bitcoin breaching um, the all-time high that it made earlier in March? I still think there are structural issues that are beneficial for Bitcoin, and I don't believe that we've hit it. Uh, hit, hit, hit the let's call it this cycle's all-time high. It won't necessarily be driven by the, the ETF demand that, that was filled already, but it will be driven by increasing awareness in a, in a broader customer base, by increasing uh, institutional participation. For example, if the institutions, the asset managers start making allocation decisions that increase, let's call it crypto holdings by 1%, uh, that's, pretty, that's a pretty dramatic increase. So while I think the the filling up of the ETFs in this current wave, that is over. There isn't a reason why we couldn't see another big wave based on some other catalysts. Again, simply asset allocation decisions made by some of the large institutions to fill up the bucket. What would be the narrative then driving Bitcoin price higher, especially in the macro environment where you know, we have inflation continuing to accelerate, something that you called correctly, by the way, um, and a Fed that may or may not create more liquidity. What, what, is, what would be the narrative pushing Bitcoin higher? So I think there are a number of issues. You've hit on a couple of them. One is the, the inflationary environment. The other is the uh, what I've called the deficit debt inflation doom loop that we're continuing to see uh, federal government deficits of, of trillions of dollars, 1.7, 1.8 trillion this year, increasing uh, government de debt by over a trillion dollars about uh, three times over the course of a year. All of these things go to the Bitcoin as money, Bitcoin as hard money thesis. And I think it has uh, a catalyst behind it. That's number one. Number two is after not seeing a whole lot of innovation, we are and we're seeing it uh, in companies here at the conference, platforms here at the conference, conference talking about how uh, Bitcoin, uh, not derivatives is not the right word, but applications built on, on Bitcoin is finally getting some traction, finally getting um, some legs. So I think there's uh, both the, the broader narrative of, of Bitcoin as money, uh, and then there is the, the development of more consumer uh, usage, usage cases, 
making it uh, friendly or easier to access, abstracting away the technology that makes it very intimidating, I think, to a lot of investors and users. So we still have a long way to go in these markets today. Uh, so you could simplify it and say that Bitcoin is a store of value and Ethereum and the broader network is acting more as a medium of exchange. None of them are perfect. Stable coins are the, where the real action is in terms of actual medium of exchange for transactions cross-border between individuals, between governments, B2C, B2B, etc. Yes, and, and as you mentioned, that in a way can be very positive for the US dollar. Um, in terms of price forecasts, though, for Bitcoin, do you have a target? Um, I think I mentioned the last time I was with you, a view, this was a couple months ago now, I said Bitcoin 100,000 by the end of the year. I hold to that. Um, it's more art than science and a, and a conviction around some of these factors. I believe that while we're going to continue to see, unfortunately, probably too much volatility, more than any of us would like in terms of the channel within Bitcoin, trades, the long-term trend over the course of this year and into next is up and to the right. Given that we have this seeming new approach to crypto from both sides of the aisle, what does it mean for the potential of a Solana ETF? Would that be the next one in the pipeline? If, if, if we've got ETH, is, is Solana the most likely one to be next if we're moving in that direction? Solana's been the big surpriser over this year. A lot of people wrote Solana off as dead. Uh, I tweeted uh, several months ago that I wrote it off as dead, that I didn't take the time to understand it. Did the exactly the wrong thing I would say as an investor, which is, you know, I bought relatively high and sold low and then and I was wrong. <laughs> Well, at least you can admit your mistake. Yeah, and, and so Solana's been the big surprise. Solana's had phenomenal success really around uh, NFTs, meme coins. It's becoming uh, the chain of choice for a lot of creatives, a lot of artists. So we'll see. I think today the market is likely too small to really justify uh, an ETF. But if you go back to the, uh, the hypothetical of what if you had an ETF that was enabled to, to hold other assets. Now, the question is, we have to have regulatory clarity on... Are these things securities or not? Bitcoin was easier. Ethereum, there was some waffling uh, by the SEC and the regulators. Solana, I don't know that uh, anyone's formed a strong view on it, although some have said maybe it looks more like a security. All right, let's bring it back to regulatory clarity then and the FIT21 Act, which aims to provide that, at least provide what the SEC has oversight over. Um, the Financial Innovation and Technology for the 21st Century Act uh, it did pass the House with, I believe, 71 Democrats actually voting for it. Fate in the Senate, not clear. What is the significance of Fit 21? To me, it was fundamental. And the reason I say that is because this was the first clear indication that there was bipartisan support for reasonable and clear crypto legislation. The crypto industry has been uh, asking, begging for years now for clarity. The SEC has been practicing uh, regulation by enforcement. Uh, Congress has been unable or unwilling to agree or to move forward on, on, on clear legislation. So this was the first evidence that at least at the House, a plurality of views across parties is recognizing the importance of technological innovation for the U.S., importance of keeping our innovators, our entrepreneurs here in the U.S. and not chasing them offshore, which is what the lack of clarity has caused over the last couple of years. It's also an indication of the point that we made when we started about how crypto is becoming an important political topic. And you could argue that this is causing concern for the Biden campaign that uh, that plank of their platform uh, is, is, at, is at risk and that the anti-crypto army is really losing uh, steam and esteem uh, within Congress. So do you think it passes the Senate? No. Still not, even with this change. Because the House has not come along. Uh, it, it's not made the progress. There is more, uh, less uh, informed views in the Senate than in the House. There's some very uh, smart people who have really dug in in the House on the issue. There are in the Senate but not enough to sway it. And I would say the, the anti-crypto army still holds greater sway in the Senate. So while I think it was an important uh, advance that it passed through the House with such strong bipartisan support, uh, I don't believe it wins the day. Uh, Biden had talked about vetoing an earlier version of a Senate bill in crypto. We'll see what actually happens if this does get passed the Senate. It doesn't feel like it will at this point. Well, something that did pass the House is Congressman Emma's anti-CBDC bill the Anti-Surveillance CBDC Act, something you've spoken extensively about at this conference. What's the significance there? 
I think it's quite important. Now, the CBDC issue has become uh, a little bit of a lightning rod. There are legitimate concerns about a central bank issued digital currency, and those concerns are it's basically a perfection of a surveillance and control system. And so there clearly has been a, a populist reaction against it. I've spoken against it or spoken about the dangers of it. But the point I've been making recently is that let's acknowledge that our current system, the financial system today, which is let's call it in private hands, has the same issues. So every day we as American consumers or anywhere around the world willingly give over our data to, to the banks to the credit card companies, to the credit reporting uh, agencies, uh, to the social media companies, big tech and, and, and big media. And we've seen uh, how in the last couple of years it's, it's come to our attention how much actual sort of collusion and what I would consider unlawful information sharing already exists without warrant, without subpoena between those big institutions and the security apparatus agencies of government. And I think that's something that we, we need to address today. In other words, the current system is already call it 90% of the, of, the, of the way there towards the dystopian fear of a surveillance state. And so we do need a reform of the existing system and tighter enforcement of laws that already exist, by the way. Uh, and CBDCs are along, further along the same train. Well, surveillance and privacy is just one issue that's problematic with the CBDC. And again, as a reminder to our viewers, central bank digital currency issued by a country central bank, a form of fiat, which would allow the government to monitor every single transaction, obliterating privacy and anonymity, but it's also programmable. And our current system doesn't really have such easily programmable currency. Yes, you could put forward an executive order and you know get someone debanked or even as a bank perhaps choose to do that. But with a programmable currency, it's so much easier to then say your money works for this transaction or doesn't work for that transaction or it works for a certain transaction but with a premium. So the privacy is one thing. The program ability is perhaps another concern that's bigger as well as the idea of what many call a pro of CBDCs and that's fine-tuning monetary policy. So instead of raising interest rates for example to control inflation in theory you could automatically, if everybody has a CBDC and an, an e-wallet, you could automatically suck out, you know, 1% of the money supply, right? So surveillance is an issue, but arguably those two factors are bigger problems. So I would argue that all of those conditions, all those negative factors exist today in the fiat system. In other words, the Fed, the government can spend. So deficit spending is an example of monetary expansion. Uh, quantitative easing is another example. You could say that CBDCs perfect and make that system even more Easy, efficient, more efficient and, but, yes. but we're already 90% of the way there and, and that's the danger. I don't think that the programmability issue is the issue. Why? Because the technology already exists today. We could design a perfect, not, not myself, but the technology exists to design a, a CBDC or other uh, privately issued stable coin that provides for privacy protection. Z, uh, zero knowledge proofs, mixers, there are, there are ways to anonymize the transactions, keep privacy uh, safe and still accomplish the, for example, anti-terrorist financing objectives and, and anti-criminal activities of, the, of, of governments. There is a balance that could be struck. There is a distinction to be made between, say, a Chinese Communist Party version of a CBDC where all of those things are just explicitly there, that they can control uh, behavior through through that, and the United States and other Western democracies where under our constitution in the US, there are privacy protections. There are five or so um, amendments to the constitution that address the, the very issue uh, and that provide this umbrella of a zone of privacy for, for citizens. The question is, will they be enforced? We've been in an era and a period of time where there's been overreach by the administrative state, uh, bypassing some of those protections that are in place. So my argument is, I, I'm not in favor of CBDCs, but I think the current system has to be reformed and we have to get control back of the citizens' right uh, to be left alone and right to privacy. Well, we certainly do. Good luck with that, though. <laughs> it's, it's challenging enough just getting agreement on, on the issues of a CBDC. Michael, as we wrap up here, where do you think will be consensus 2025 in terms of the crypto landscape? And yes, look into your crystal ball. Well, first of all, we'll be post um, the elections. 
and I think that will be binary, maybe too strong of a, of a word, but we could end up in a situation where regulation turns uh, much more favorable, where we can reattract some of the capital and some of the talents uh, that has been lost in the last few years under this uh, regulatory regime that has been very hostile to the crypto industry. That would be a big boon for the United States, very favorable for the development of the industry here. So I think, and based on everything we know right now, that appears more likely than not that we might see a change, um, and that would be good for the for the industry. So I think that next year, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm bullish on where we will be. Uh, in that 12 to 24 month period. Longer term, even though we've had a tactical shift uh, in political views around this issue, I don't think it reflects a fundamental awakening uh, on the part of some people in government about the industry. I, I believe that at its core, government does not like the idea of privacy, does not like the idea of monetary freedom. And so we are gonna continue to live in a tension uh, between these two forces of monetary freedom and political freedom. All right. Well, we'll check in with you, Consensus 2025. Thanks for joining us today. Appreciate your insights as always. Michael Wilkerson. Thank you, Michelle. Getco News special coverage of Consensus 2024 is brought to you by Diamond Standard.